call the Finance Committee meeting to order at 5.02 p.m. for March 18th, 24. You guys want to call your select board? I will call our meeting to get, oh, um, at 504 tonight. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, first up is reviewing minutes from the previous meeting. I move that we accept the minutes of um, <laughs> March 11th. Do we have a second? Second. Any discussion? Yeah, I have two points. Okay. I, at the beginning of the meeting last week, I mentioned I wanted to recuse myself from any discussions of school transportation. Okay. And I would like that to be in the minutes. I'd okay. Like to be officially on the record. I would do so. Okay. Pardon? I would do so. Okay. And the other thing is I thought an account, maybe it's me, account 422-5110, the general highway payroll. I think somebody voted no on that. I have 510. Yeah, I yeah. think so. Oh, my mistake. I didn't catch that, sorry. Good catch. Good job. Right. Um, <laughs> I move to amend the minutes to correct that error. I'll send out a first second uh, movement to amend the minutes. Okay. Um, so do we have a second on amending the minutes as you seconded? Yes, All right. Any discussion on the amendments recommended? All those in favor of amending as said? Uh, against? Abstain. All right, so that passes one, two, three, four, five, zero, one. No, six must be six, six zero, zero one. one. That was town building. <laughs> that was town building. <laughs> I think I'm on count. I'm on the so finance committee. Yeah. That was the town building. Maybe this year. General Highway. General. Okay, then I'll move this back and both. Well, three, two. Okay. Yeah, it's four twenty two fifty one ten. I think. General Highway Payroll. All right, so we have um, um, agreed to an amendment to the minutes. So, any further discussion on the minutes? All those in favor of approving the minutes as amended? Against? Abstain. That passes 601. All right. Okay, now we're ready. So, we now have South County EMS. Um, that should be in tab 10. And I handed out a new one last week, so you should all have the most recent version of it. For, it says 311 down at the bottom? Yes. Okay. Yep. And have all of you met Joshua Sparks, our new chief? Yeah. Hi. We have. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hi. Uh, seeing some of you again. Welcome to Deerfield. <laughs> We're happy to have you here. Thank you. I'm Julie Chalfon. I'm chair of Finance Committee. Do you want to, why don't we just quickly? <laughs> uh, Mark Brennan, Finance. Beth Brown. Margaret Nardowitz. Sean Koreski. Glad to meet you. Dave Sharp. James Campbell. <laughs> there won't be a quiz at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Joshua Sparks, S P A R K S. <laughs> All right, so I just had a grad student who spelled his name J-O-U-S-H, so. Yeah, that's, that's not acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're ready, sorry. <laughs> so it's been, has it been moved in second? No, it hasn't. Okay. Do we have a motion? Uh-oh, it your mic is not no. working. Uh, where's Trevor when we need him? Can we move it while we do this? Oh, maybe I kicked it off. <laughs> oh, that's what that was. Yep. That's it. Back on. You, um, I'll try not to kick it. <laughs> it was a very subtle movement when I felt I kicked everything. Uh, what I wanted to do is ask, uh, my, my skims budget has 311 and then it has the second page that says, Oh, no, it's updated three for three months. So good, I've got everything. Thanks. Great. Okay. Sorry about that. I recommend the SCEMS budget for $462,966. Yes, I printed it on 311. 
Second. Second. Does I have a pen? I can borrow an extra pen. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So we're ready. Um, Tim and Joshua have done, I think, a, a really good job with this Thank budget. You. I think your original version was showing um, Deerfield's portion at 532,000, and it's now showing at 462,000. I just thought I'd point that out. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll just hand it off to Josh, and he can talk, um, and then you can ask questions. Does that sound good? You can talk about the things that might be changing. Sure. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> overall, we are looking at uh, something of an increase. This was to be expected. Uh, as I understand it, uh, there was very little put into retained earnings from last year, uh, which would normally help offset uh, the budget. So the big changes for this year are the addition of me uh, within the payroll. Uh, we do have a step increase and a 2% COLA uh, for all of our uh, employees. Uh, so that makes a big difference. And then on top of that, we have a provision here, a new line item, uh, which is for uh, overtime for training. Um, and this is uh, in personnel costs below call staff. It says training on the amount of 16938 I'll come back to that. And then because of our anticipated revenue, uh, we've put in uh, the uh, expected retained earnings uh, up from a 625 uh, up to 800,000, which I still view as being a bit conservative. Uh, we stand to do a bit better than that, but just erring with uh, some caution. So those are the big ones. And the, CPE. the CPE, of course, uh, I also believe is uh, a little bit low, but not very much. Uh, does does everybody uh, know what the CPE is? Is that? Why don't you go ahead and cover it? Yeah. Sure. So the CPE uh, is a program uh, in the Commonwealth that any ambulance service provider can apply for. Uh, and not a lot of them do, but uh, people are starting to wake up to it. And when we go on an ambulance call, if a patient has Medicaid or MassHealth, uh, they're great about paying, I'll say that. Uh, but the amount that they pay is typically far lower than even what Medicare pays. It's kind of the lowest payment we're going to receive um, Below that, we tend to not get paid at all. So what the CPE program does is attempt to pay some of the difference between what we bill for Medicaid patients and what we actually receive. And so it's based off of all kinds of expenses. There's a, uh, it's kind of an onerous process to go through it, uh, but definitely worth the time. Uh, where we look at our operational costs, everything from vehicles to buildings to equipment to personnel to utilities, you name it, uh, really forces us to take a very detailed look at uh, our operational expenses. Um, and then we look at our calls, how much we build for them, how much we've received for them, and then we break that down by different payer groups. Um, and this attempts to determine okay, how much can we pay out? And it's a big fund um, that uh, is shared. So uh, we get a percentage of that based upon uh, the expenses. And so this year, uh, we do stand to do pretty well from it. It's essentially a way to uh, collect some of the money that we maybe should have gotten in the first place, right? That is one way to look at it. Um, but it's it's not a mandatory participation, so uh, that's a nice program um, that can hopefully help offset uh, some of the increases. Is there a line item where that's showing? Yeah, on page two, um, revenue from service and retained earnings. So right below medical service fees, medical service fees is what we receive for 
billing, insurance, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, self-pays, uh, things like that, right? Uh, so the CPE fund uh, is a new line item. Uh, we estimate a $45,000 um, payment. We will get a payment um, somewhere in that range. What is the expense window? to determine that payment? Is it the prior year? It, what is, yeah, what's the window for that? Yeah, so it, it goes by, uh, Tim, is that fiscal or calendar? I think it's fiscal year. So it looks at the previous fiscal year. Uh, so the reporting period generally opens up in September or October. And uh, you take a couple of months to collect data and submit it. And then there's a step review process um, by the agency who oversees it. And uh, typically, we can expect to see that paid out around the beginning of the next fiscal year. When do you know the, the actual CDE number? When do you learn that number? When the check comes in the mail. Yeah. They, there, don't, they don't give you an the, There is a, yeah, there, there is information, um, there is a calculation, uh, and that's what we have is the $45,000, but it could vary slightly. Is the retained earnings lower because we spent that on something? Like yeah, that? so um, last year uh, there was the cardiac monitor and Lucas uh, spending. Uh, we were able to recoup some of that because of a successful uh, uh, grant being awarded. Um, and so we talked last week uh, about shifting some of that funds around, uh, but that's why. We had been saving um, for the ambulance at $50,000 a year, but then when we went to order it, it's a two-year waiting line, and which we decided we had to do that, but also it was 475000 instead of 350000 And it was such a price jump. Three seventy-five. Three seventy-five. Three seventy-five. Oh, yeah, that's okay. Correct. Excuse me. Of, I think originally 275 was the thought, right? Right. Yeah. And then, so that that's where the additional 100 went. I'm going to just say that 375 for an ambulance like that is a good deal. Uh, they're not getting any cheaper. Um, so, uh, you know, we're in process, uh, the Board of Oversight and I, uh, at the next meeting, we're going to start a uh, capital plan uh, moving forward. Uh, but at least we're able to put some amount of retained earnings into this budget, uh, anticipating that we're going to need that, right? We're, uh, it takes two to three years from the time we order an ambulance um, to the time we actually see it. So it's something we really have to plan ahead for uh, and stay ahead of, so. so just, go ahead. Just a point of clarification. How much has been appropriated or how much has been set aside for the ambulance so far? So far going into this budget, uh, there's $80,000 that uh, retained earnings. Uh, so we have not developed the capital plan yet. Um, did Can I clarify that? Yeah, please. Um, so we, we voted on an ambulance last spring and we used 100,000 in retained earnings and then each community um, had a capital line item to to uh, put into that to make it to the 375. So the most recent ambulance that we need to order is is we've got the funds for it. Got it. Thank yep. you very much. So yes. now we're probably going to end up using all of this retained earnings. Hopefully at the end of this fiscal year, the way things are running, we're going to have a good amount to put back into retained earnings, and then they can start saving for the next one. Thank you. Yeah. And is that ambulance on order already, and is the price guaranteed, or is it going to yeah. go up? Yeah, the, uh, well, I mean, yeah, the price is guaranteed. Uh, it is on order. The chassis already arrived. Uh, we won't see it for at least another year, if not longer, but it's in process. Nice. Can I ask a question, Brenda? Um, did I understand you correctly to say that the money for this new ambulance is already in place, or did I misunderstand what you said? So in other words, is there 375000 somewhere? We should, yes. <laughs> so with that said, I haven't billed the other two communities for their share yet, but I was going to wait till we got closer to the end of the fiscal year. 
but Deerfield's portion was voted. I know that each town voted their share and the retained earnings was voted. So it's all set, ready to go, just the process of getting it in there. So when all that's done, there's gonna be $375,000 available. Okay, so it's the next ambulance that we're worrying about. Okay, good, thank you. One that hasn't been even considered yet. Just trying to stay ahead of it. So retained, I mean not retained earning, the, the service fees went up quite a bit from last year. Can you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. So this is based on a couple of things. First is we did do a rate increase uh, last year, um, which has made a marginal uh, impact. Uh, just because we charge more doesn't mean we and receive we more. more. Right, right. <laughs> so, um, but on top of that, our call volume is increasing. You, you can expect year to year you're going to see a small percent call volume increase. Um, and at small levels, we don't really worry about wear and tear and a massive increase in cost uh, to operate those additional calls. But we do see additional revenue coming in for them. So one of the things that's very important uh, for our organization moving forward is uh, doing as many calls as we possibly can. Uh, essentially, I'm paying people whether they're on an ambulance call or if they're sitting at the station. So hopefully we can avail ourselves to a greater call volume. We put our three communities first, of course. Um, that is our primary objective. Um, but the idea is that we can capture additional revenue and help offset um, the assessments uh, <coughs> moving forward. So looking at even what we've received this fiscal year, uh, I believe the 800,000 uh, that we put in here is conservative. Uh, we're looking to do better than that. And uh, Brenda, I believe you came up with that formula. Yeah, I, I looked at what we had received through the end of January at this point in time, and and then just averaged it out and said, okay, if we, uh, that average was like $68,000 a month. If we did $68,000 a month between now and the end of the fiscal year, we'd have 823,000. Now what's interesting is February, a short month, ended up at 77,000. So it just confirmed that things are, um, uh, we're in a good position. So I, I felt pretty comfortable when Josh and I were talking about it to make that decision on the 800. I'll be very happy uh, to come back to you, you know, next time and say, hey, we did way better than 800,000, but seems like reasonable uh, based off the, uh, the projection. Is um, ZMS, is it cyclical at all with the seasons or is it sure pretty is. steady or? Yeah. When, when's your, um, when's the season we should be worrying? <laughs> so things, uh, well, I, let me just there's, add a caveat here that uh, I'm new to this area, so uh, it may differ from what I know. Um, typically, the autumn is one of the busier times of year, and things actually slow down in the summer. That may be different here. Sometimes you see, um, you know, the exact opposite of that. So. But it is cyclical. Uh, it's based on tourism. It's based on school attendance, colleges. Uh, it's based off of transportation, voodoo, phases of the moon. Uh, I'm not sure uh, all what goes into it. Right. You're right. Sure. So, but yeah, it has its season. This is not typically one of the busier seasons. Not as many as I would like, uh, but we have increased our availability for intercepts. So uh, there are uh, just a couple of standard definitions here. An intercept, uh, so that everybody knows, is when a ambulance, uh, basic life support ambulance, or another paramedic ambulance says, hey, we need help. Can you send us some paramedics? And we will meet up with that ambulance. There's a patient in that ambulance already. We take our bags, we jump in the back of their truck and provide patient care. We then go to the hospital. We cannot bill 
that call. We cannot bill for mileage. We cannot bill their insurance. We're not the transporting provider. So the only way that we can uh, receive compensation for that work is to bill the calling provider. Uh, we usually have some type of agreement with the different agencies saying, hey, if we come do this, can you throw me this much money? It's a determined fee. It varies between 275 to, in some places, as high as $450, depending on the agency. Um, personally, uh, as much as I like gaining revenue for uh, the organization, I like to keep it on the lower side of things. Um, because they're not going to receive very much uh, as reimbursement for their own call, right? So it's, it distributes it more fairly. So that's in contrast to a mutual aid call. In a mutual aid call, what happens is we go as the primary transporting ambulance because the calling community does not have an ambulance available or there's something precluding them from transporting the patient. And so mutual aid has, in either way, we're sending a crew out of town to go do work somewhere, right? So whether they go in our ambulance, whether we go in their ambulance, our crew is still tied up. Uh, thankfully, we're in a really good position uh, during the week that we're able to do that because of our second ambulance being staffed. Uh, so, you know, my goal is that we can make ourselves more and more available uh, to do this kind of work, keeping units available for our own communities, but when able, going out to help, because we're really one of the only, well, we are the only regional advanced life support service in the area. Uh, so that's an amazing resource, and it stands to reason that people would want to use us if we're available. Historically, we have not been. So uh, that's something that you know we've we've made a lot of progress on that I hope to continue. Um, one thing I just want to say is we're moving in the right direction. Um, when I heard about the CPE money um, randomly at a Homeland Security meeting last year, um, I wanted us to move on it. And it really, when Tim came on board, he started the paperwork, and it was pretty um, significant so that we couldn't collect this past year. But it is in line. We're going to make be collecting for this year. And, um, you know, we have meetings with, we had a meeting immediately with Comstar and, and straightened out some of our payables and the huge amount of um, write-offs that we had. And I just have to say that even though Josh has only been here for a few weeks, it really is continuing the direction that Tim has really um, tried to get a handle on. And it, it's been wonderful because we've had, you know, issues and we feel so much better about what is happening. So I just want to say we're going in the right direction. Are you caught up on your write-offs, and, and how frequently are you are you doing this? Tim has been doing it monthly, and I, I'm assuming that Josh is doing the same thing. There that, was, that, that's correct. Difference uh, once we have the meeting with Comstar. Um, can I speak? Question. Go ahead. Salaries and wages. If I back out the director's salary, increase 13 percent um, from. 2024. I guess why? Sure, well, I can speak to that. So, one of the process. So, in addition to the step increase, in addition to the cola increase, um, <coughs> excuse me, we've had a vacant deputy chief position uh, for some time that I would like to fill in the foreseeable future. This is budgeted for half a year. Um, so to bring somebody on uh, b nearing the beginning of the third quarter of the fiscal year. In addition to that, uh, I am seeking a uh, third party national accreditation process for the agency. And one of the things that's going to be really important for that process is having adequate supervisory coverage 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So right now we have a gap overnight and on the weekends. So this adds uh, 
a increase for existing employees. This isn't looking to put on additional people, but this does add for uh, another uh, half a year of supervisory increases for two people. And I'll also just want to mention that um, the, the position that Joshua took um, when he joined us was slated to have an increase to like 102,000 this year. So it went from 102 this year to 115 this year. So it's not quite as dramatic, although it is still dramatic increase in the in the super and the chief's role. So I'm sorry, say that again. What went from 102 to 115? Well, in 2024, um, the director's salary was. Um, what was it? Oh, 96. 96. It was supposed to go up to 102 if, if the person oh, okay. hadn't left. Right. Okay. The person Got left. It. And we paid what we needed to pay to get the person we wanted. You couldn't take a pay cut. What was the uh, um, certification you said you were going for? Uh, so it's going to take me probably a year or two for us to develop uh, the process. But uh, what I'm looking for is CAS accreditation. Is a uh, it's a third party accrediting agency uh, for ambulance services. And what's the benefit of having that? The benefit is huge. Uh, basically, it lets us have benchmarks, right? So uh, it's one thing to say we think we're really great and we pat ourselves on the back and look at what a good job we do and everybody can love us, but are we? Uh, what are we measuring that against? So it's measuring uh, against uh, very high performing national standards. On top of that, it gives you a roadmap, which is really amazing. Uh, it gives you a process to follow, uh, which says very successful uh, agencies um, have different processes that they can follow uh, to remain sustainable, to increase revenues for safety, uh, for reliability, for optimal patient care, and just being all around progressive as an agency. So uh, really the only drawback uh, to pursuing that is just the time I put into it. Okay. Can I ask one more question? Yeah. <laughs> um, I feel like maybe last year we talked, I know you weren't here, but um, for the mutual uh, mutual aid calls that 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 was one of the reasons about the staffing and having the extra ambulance. So why do you think those are going to continue to increase? Like what, what was holding us back from? Perception. Okay. Like of our, our own perception of what we were able to respond to or like yeah. other people's okay. response? Okay. Certainly. Okay. So, like I said, we can anticipate there's going to be a call volume increase to a small percentage annually. What was it last year, Tim? Uh, we went from 1130 to 1352. So this last calendar year, we did 1,352 calls. And in 2023, we did 11, 11 something. I can't remember the number on the top of my head. But it was uh, just about a 200 call increase from last year and this year. Sure, and so, yeah, we did 1,361 in 2023. So we can reliably predict that there's going to be some increase. The world just gets busier, it doesn't get slower. So that's great, but there's a lot of calls that we're not available. Uh, I've sat in our station and watched other communities respond to calls that we're closer to because we weren't available to go do it. And we've got a crew sitting in the station. Uh, to me, that's just absurd. So by making us available to go do those calls, we can capture that revenue when we'd otherwise be missing out on it. And you know, there is, of course, a, a, you know, a greater ethical reason to go do the call. Uh, in addition to the money. And I, I don't like the, to speak in purely financial terms about the work we do, but this is finance this committee. This is the finance so, committee, so. Yeah, so um, but uh, I believe that there is 
a golden opportunity right now. If, if I were able to throw massive resources at this right now, which I know we cannot do, uh, we could do a lot. So if you respond to a call and then we have a call within Deerfield, do we then reach out to somebody else for mutual aid for our people? Correct. That... It's, it's an interesting thing. There is, in the emergency services world, whatever the department, this could be the fire service, this could be EMS, unless you're a very large city, and in the Commonwealth, we're looking at Springfield, Worcester, Fall River, Boston, really big communities with large departments. There is not a single agency in the state uh, that is capable of handling its own operational area by itself. It's just not possible. There's no way that we can do every single call with one and a half ambulances in the three towns that we cover. There's no way that Greenfield can do all of their volume with the two and a half to three ambulances that they have sometimes. And not to pick on Greenfield, they're, they're a great bunch of folks. So we have to rely on each other. Uh, it really is a, it takes a village mindset when we're talking about providing emergency services. But there's no reason to be siloed. Uh, we can actually extend that offer and make ourselves more available to it. So right now we're in a really good position. Um, one of the examples that came up uh, my first meeting uh, with the Board of Oversight was responses to Greenfield. And I don't think there was concern. I think there was a question of why are we going to Greenfield so often. And it turns out we're really not going to Greenfield that often at all. In the first two quarters of the year, we'd gone there 60 times. Right? We'd missed uh, less than 10 calls in our primary service area, so there is a trade-off there. But we generated a lot of revenue from doing that. So to me, those numbers work in our favor, absolutely. So that's a circuitous way of answering your question, for sure, but uh, you know that informs it. So if we're out doing something, then somebody else will come from somewhere else to cover our call. And we have to do this. If we didn't do this on a normal day, nothing would function. Uh, it's essential to the way our system is set up. You know, this isn't... Uh, the Otherwise you'd be way overstaffed. Well, that's the thing. I mean, this yeah. isn't, you know, a nationalized health service ambulance that has single-payer funding or anything like that. This is very insurance-driven. Uh, that's just the way our health system is set up, so... So can you say again, for the national accreditation, you're going to look for supervision for nights and weekends because you're there during the day, during the week. Right. Um, so, and you said two people. So is this like you pick two of your people and they become supervisors? Or is it like there are people who are qualified to be supervisors and on the shifts that they're on, they get, I don't know, a stipend? or something? How does that work? Yeah, so that's great. So. The short answer is yes, we'll pick two people, but uh, that's going to be quite a task in and of itself. Uh, the way we go about it is through promotional exams, um, interviews, and assessments to try and make it as fair as possible and to exclude ourselves from it as much as possible. Uh, ultimately, yeah, the choice is ours who we're going to put into that position, but you know that decision can be informed by third-party data. Uh, which is really helpful for us in being non-discriminatory. Uh, you know, we certainly don't want to be in a position of nepotism or favoritism or anything like that. So we try to make it fair. Um, and from there, um, you really do, uh, for a supervisor, you want them to be trained. You want their duties and obligations to be built into their actual job description. Um, somebody who's receiving a stipend to be the supervisor today uh, is not a supervisor. It's just somebody getting paid a little more, right, to make an uninformed decision. So, yes. Um, for the next year, you're budgeting 53000 for overtime for, hol for holiday pay, and there's not... There's no such line item for earlier years? So in previous years, that line had been blacked out. 
Um, I'm not sure why. Uh, this is a, a town of Deerfield bylaw that bylaw employees um, earned time such as holiday, sick, vacation time do count towards the calculation of overtime within a week. Yeah, I've never seen it before. It's unusual. Uh, I guess it's very generous, um, but this is just based off of the town bylaw. So this has not been budgeted for uh, in the past, so it's important. Yeah. Um, I think I think in fiscal 24 it could be that this particular spreadsheet just blacked out that line but the, but it there those two lines were separate last year that's my recollection and that maybe that's an error on my part that that's blacked out but the number is there so it's included in the 998 salaries and wages I, I think so that without actually adding it up I believe that's that's correct you could add it if you want but um, I think that was in response to why is your overtime so high? So Zoe had separated that out in fiscal 24. That's does yes, that sound right to you? Yeah. Yes. Okay. We, remember, right. we had a few issues with overtime last yeah, year. A huge discussion. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so the that was why the holiday pay had to be separate because that was always consistent. You were going to pay holiday pay no matter what. So what we were looking at was the actual overtime that we were paying for work related versus the holiday time we we have to have our personnel bylaw changed to um not pay the holiday time as overtime that has been um a consistent issue for you know the last five or six years i don't i don't remember brenda when we first discovered it but it was a while ago mm -hmm. and we have not been able to um have the personnel um bylaw changed yet. So that's going to be changed at the annual town meeting with the change in the entire personnel bylaw? Um, I think we're going to attempt it, right? I think so. Yeah, yeah. it should. That's what I hear. But we'll yes. see. Um, okay. So this, it actually, I just added it up. Yes. So it was, it was 50598 last right. year. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So I just have it blacked out, but it's, it's there. <laughs> And, and so it looks as if in years before that they were amalgamated because the the figures in 22, 23, 21, et cetera, are considerably larger. Yes, and I think that's why that line was blacked out because it was added last year, and the previous years were blacked out. Uh, uh, question. Um, back to the deputy chief position. I actually have a couple of questions. Um, did, uh, did you did you state earlier that the service has not had a deputy chief to date? That's something that you're looking to add, or had, did it have one and it's been vacant? My understanding is that the position has been vacant. I don't know when the last time that seat was filled. Six months ago. So, uh, you know. I think that th as we look to increase mutual aid, as we look to get busier, and as we look to accredit, and uh, a whole other initiative that hasn't even come up is uh, community EMS, uh, which is another thing, we're going to need the additional layer of administrative support. So you said it's budgeted um, for FY25 for half a year. What is that amount? Um, built into the salaries line? So I, well, again, we have to um, work with this, but I put in $45,000. How perilous, so it's no secret that the town is having a bit of a budget crunch um, this year, where we have a bit of a deficit. How detrimental or how perilous would it be to the service if that had to wait uh, one fiscal year? Well, I mean, 
There's always room for flexibility, for sure. I think not having that layer of administrative support beyond what we have right now will hold us back in some of our initiatives. Um, a lot of the initiatives are very low to zero cost, such as in community EMS, which is great. So you get a lot of value, but you need somebody to support it or else it just doesn't happen. Um, on top of that, uh, I like my job a lot. I feel like I've hit the jackpot here, um, but I don't want to be working 100 hour weeks every week. So, uh, you know, it would be very helpful. So what's the argument for having a deputy versus, I didn't ask this right, but you, there, there's the possibility of having admin assistant, right? There's an admin person in police and in highway and stuff, and you guys don't have an admin. So, I, th th trust me, that'd be great. I'd love to have an admin in the building. Uh, it would be wonderful. Uh, the difference is that deputy and I during the day when we're both in the office can hop in a car and go do intercepts. That deputy can handle day-to-day -day operational oversight, including things that involve a lot of institutional and uh, industry knowledge uh, that I suppose an admin could learn and develop over years of time, but they're never gonna be able to go do a call with me. How much do you, um, so when you have training or say you have somebody call in sick or something, could you and or the deputy fill in for people when they were gone? That's a possibility. Uh, at this point, I still cannot. Uh, I've been so devoted to office work uh, that I haven't even uh, been cleared by our medical director to work on an ambulance yet. Uh, that'll happen at, at some point. Uh, but ultimately, the reality is that's a staffing problem that we should seek to solve instead of taking away from something else, right? If I, if I try to cover another job, I'm not doing my primary job, right? Um, and that other job doesn't have the support that it needs either. So the way that it works currently is if there is a call out uh, well, then first come, first serve. We're going to page that out, and if you can work it, please come do. If we know about it in advance, uh, a week or two out, then we'll page it out to uh, non-overtime per diem employees and usually get it filled. Yeah. So if you were to get this, this deputy, you said they, were, they would probably be you know, able to help out with intercept calls. Would they be able to help out with mutual aid as well? So, or would that be practical? I, I should say it would be magical. Yeah. Um, can I get another ambulance? I'll need garage too. Um, <laughs> well, okay. So I guess going back to the um, intercepts, then how many um, additional intercepts would we be able to do with that deputy? It's all going to depend on what type of agreements we make over the next year or two. Uh, with some of the surrounding communities and it's really hard to estimate that because we have to trend this and we have to be very careful about it. We need to approach it very slowly. Um, I could easily go to every town around us and say, hey, give me a call. But the reality is, is if I do that, we're not going to be doing our own calls. We're going to be doing everybody else's and we need to avoid that, right? I'm happy to do everybody else's calls too, as long as we're doing our own. So really we need to look at the data. We need to see how does this look? What are we missing in our primary service area? Um, is it acceptable? Is it not? Do I need to put that second ambulance up 24 hours a day? Do I need to increase our own uh, coverage? Or do I need to scale it back? And we just don't know. Well, we've only had this process rolling for five weeks now, so it's just not there yet. Uh, so if you were to do um, a, uh, an intercept, uh, what, what's the average revenue per intercept if you do that? It varies. Uh, so 
most of the time we're getting uh, $275 and up, which doesn't seem like much, right? But it certainly more than covers the cost of the call. I'm more than covering payroll on it. Um, and again, right now I'm paying that same crew to not make that money. So I'll take that any day. So if you were to have a, a deputy with a $45,000 increase, that would, for 275 calls, would, uh, or 275 per call, that would be another 163 intercepts you would have to do to break even on the revenue for that. That's not bad at all. Is that doable? Oh, for sure. That's for half a year. Yeah, for a half a year. And then, you know, if we were to do it for a full year, it would... Uh, let's see, I went to public school, uh, 327, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I looked, uh, just doing fictitious uh, napkin math, right? I looked at uh, a hypothetical Turner's Falls scenario. Uh, we're not obligated, we're not committed, we don't have an agreement in place with Turner's Falls. I'm just using this as an example. So if I did 60% of their call volume annually, and we just said that's $275. I'm looking to bring in $130,000 in revenue off of that one town and only doing 60%. That's pretty good. Now, the reality is, <clears throat> is we'd be doing probably more than that. And on top of that, many of those would not be intercepts. They would be primary ambulance transports, which allow us to bill, in some cases, thousands of dollars more. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, at its most conservative low ball number, we're looking at $130,000 with a community like Turner's Falls. If we look to other communities and, we, you know, we are so perfectly positioned for this. Like, it's, it's a jackpot. And it's a time when all of the other services around us really need the help, and we have it to give. So uh, strike while the iron's hot, right? This is a little bit different attitude. Um, we were worried um, that we were pulling away from our ability to answer our own calls, but Joss has done a lot of analysis of this, and and the additional calls, even with wear and tear, and um, it it seems like it's doable, and and so I just want to make sure that um, you know we're not just committing. We were hesitant as a Boo Oversight Board doing anything like this before, and there was no desire to to reach out. But since Josh has been here, he's analyzed this. And he's seen that we need more revenue to be sustainable, which is what um, has been really critical, is to get revenue up without impacting our service ne um, negatively. And obviously, like he pointed out, there are times, no matter, even if with all our crews sitting in the um, bays, there are times when there's multiple calls coming in, and then you cannot obviously answer more than two ambulances worth at a time. But he feels that we can do this. He's analyzed it, and I think with his experience that it is not going to be negative, that we are in fact going to generate more revenue, which will make us more sustainable, which, was the pro or which is what our problem is right now. So when you go on an intercept, do you take an ambulance with you? I'm glad you brought that up. Well, that yeah, wow, that was good timing. <laughs> I think it's going to be an intercept vehicle, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, w you know, right now, if we went on an intercept, yes, we would. We would take the ambulance with us. And some of the times, what's going to happen is we're going to show up, and they'll be patient loaded in the back of their ambulance already. We'll meet them in front of the location, or we'll meet them on the road. Uh, pull over to the side and hop in back of their ambulance and do our thing. We have, uh, this came up at Finance Committee uh, two weeks ago, I believe, last week. Um, so, CIPC? Capital, yeah. Yeah, Capital, that was it. Um, so one of the things, we have a uh, very ancient Ford Explorer that was uh, graciously handed down from the police department. 
And as I explained it at Capitol, uh, it's kind of held together with rust and medical tape. And uh, we are looking to replace that by shifting around other capital projects um, that weren't utilized um, and some amount of retained earnings too to replace that. That gives us an intercept vehicle, a fly car, you nailed it, um, which can be staffed during the daytime initially by myself and that deputy. And then as time moves on, uh, if we need to staff that full time, that's something we can look at. The cool thing about a vehicle like that is it can also be staffed as a uh, single uh, provider, which is really nice. Uh, so in that capacity, it gets to do a lot of good as a rapid response vehicle. It can also be used for community EMS resources. So. Um, Brenda informs me that you know there's another meeting tonight, so probably a good idea to broach the subject. But when you hear about it, that's what it's for. So yeah, I actually had a follow up to the um, intercept and mutual aid. So I, I see that the fuel cost is going up from twelve thousand <coughs> to eighteen thousand. Mm -hmm. um, but I also see that electricity is basically level funded. So if this goes to electric vehicles, you know, for the the intercept vehicles, are we going to shift from the fuel budget to electricity, or should we be adding electricity here? How is that going to work? <clears throat> it's all a guess, right? So at this point, we can reasonably expect that our fuel will increase as we go do more calls, fuel prices go up and down, uh, but we can expect to be using more fuel. If that's in the form of an electric vehicle, which you know, I don't think the majority of our intercept work is going to be done in that vehicle, but a good amount of it will. Um, then, yeah, we just transfer one line to the next. Okay. And then um, one of the other questions I had was uh, the software fees. Could you elaborate on the increase from the, you know, 7,800 to 14,000 on the uh, software increase? Yeah. So we have added. Um, or budgeted for a station alerting system, uh, which has a annual fee. Um, oh, I see. So there's going to be the capital and then the OPEX. Correct. Uh, okay, so the OPEX goes in this line. Okay. That's correct. And hopefully that decreases once again substantially in the ensuing years, but to get it off the ground uh, takes a little bit more. Okay. And then also I see that the uh, telephone and the internet jumped pretty, uh, pretty high. Could you explain? I'd love to increase? get rid of that entirely. Uh, right now, I'm budgeting it as a worst case scenario because uh, I don't know why we pay so much uh, for some of these telecommunication services that we do. Uh, it, it's beyond me. So that's another thing that uh, I know Casey was working on uh, to try and get us involved uh, into the municipal plan. Uh, for internet, for television, for things like that. Uh, the phone provider that we have, uh, just the phone provider actually isn't all that bad. Um, but there's a lot of things that get paid out of that. Okay. That's all my questions. Thank you. We're pushing to get that fixed. Great. Soon. I was going to say, let's get you some Netflix or something. You know. yeah. <laughs> wow. So just, yeah. just a question on logistics and timing. Um, you noted that you're not you're not certified yet to be in the ambulance. You've been very, very busy working on administrative things. Um, you're looking at adding a deputy chief position for what, the second half of the year? Correct. The second half of the year. So do you anticipate that you would be ready to go by then? Of course. And so we're also looking at use of the fly car in addition to the ambulances. So you'd want to be sure that you still have your staffing to staff the existing ambulances and have the staff to be able to ride out in the fly car. Is that? Is you, that correct? You've got it. Oh. Okay. Josh, can you just uh, explain the certification and how, when you talk about being cleared, you have to, it's, it's yeah. paperwork and stuff. So it is. Uh, it's, uh, there's a bit of process involved. So I am certified. Um, I, I'm a nationally registered paramedic. Um, I can go authorize in most, uh, I can practice in most states uh, in the nation. Uh, I've been working as a paramedic in Massachusetts for over 20 years now. Um, I can absolutely go work on an ambulance. When you start at a new service, they have different medical directors through their affiliate hospital, um, and they all have different rules uh, about 
authorization to practice. Um, out here, the way that it's done uh, is there's a minimum threshold. It's kind of a line in the sand number of calls that have to be done, charts that have to be written, uh, things like that. Um, so it just means I'm going to have to tear myself away from the office and go third right on an ambulance. But that's really achievable. And probably more fun. Well, third riding on an ambulance, you know, I don't know, arguably. Yeah. Do you have to sit in the middle? I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'm, I'm sitting up front is where I'm sitting. <laughs> so. He is in charge. Yeah. <laughs> Um, any other questions on the budget? Can you, so you have some capital, we, we aren't voting capital tonight, but since we won't see you again, probably, um, can you talk a little bit about the capital, your capital requests? Yeah, absolutely. So the capital requests, um, I don't have those in front of me. Um, thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Brenda. All right, so uh, the first thing here we're looking at is the exhaust system. Uh, this, we have an opportunity to obtain a free vehicle exhaust system for our station, so we basically said, now we don't need that anymore, uh, which is pretty great. Um, the cardiac monitor replacement uh, from last fiscal year, uh, this was $150,000. Uh, because of uh, Lori McCombs' efforts, um, we were awarded a grant, and we didn't end up spending $44,000 of those funds. So we're looking to shift those funds, uh, and I believe that was going towards the towards the intercept vehicle. So that's pretty snazzy. Um, the intercept vehicle itself, we're looking at $60,000 for the vehicle, which is pretty standard for that type of vehicle. And then we're looking at, we estimate around $15,000 um, for the installation of the electrical charging. Uh, we hope to pay for that out of um, our rent yeah. uh, line item, right? Okay. Okay. Um, and then uh, the station alerting system is reall reallocated from the exhaust project. You know, temporary um, station. Oh, nice. So if, if you understood that, the vehicle will be covered with, with two pots of money, part of it out of retained earnings and part of it out of the 44000 that we didn't spend on the cardiac monitor, if that makes sense? Yeah. And we finally get to use rent. And we get to use rent, yeah. which is great, right? Yeah. Um, so, uh, <coughs> You know, that's the gist of it. Uh, there was another capital project to replace a uh, stretcher mm -hmm. uh, that desperately needs replacement. Uh, that's kind of a make or break thing. We just, we can't not have a stretcher, right? This one I think comes out of retained earnings, right? That's correct. Yeah. Have any businesses been approached about donation of stretcher? That's a, that's a pretty common one for municipal um, EMS services to have things like this donated by by local business commercial stakeholders. Um, I'm wondering if there's been any any effort to reach out to anybody to see if they might Not be able to do that. <coughs> um, Yankee Candle used to give um, considerable, uh, when it was locally owned, considerable gifts. Mm -hmm. But um, pretty much now they give a standard gift that rotates between the communities and it's what, for around 5,000. I want to say 4,000, 4, maybe, maybe yeah. 5,000. I don't remember what you yeah, was. Yeah, it's 5,000, so it's not nearly en enough to. 45. How about our new, how about oh, our 4,500? What's that? Our new social, uh, you know, local social establishment, the big place, it's drawing a lot of people, <laughs> three house. Oh, there you go. Ooh. Yeah. We're already having some conversations <laughs> with them. Say, just, you know. So, uh, thank you, Casey, for these. Uh, so, yeah, the 
The rapid response intercept vehicle, uh, we're estimating $75,000. This is reallocation of the cardiac monitor funds, auction of the current vehicle, retained earnings uh, from service fees. Um, I'm also hoping that we can roll this into um, and, and get some more credit uh, for the purchase of it uh, because it's not the only electric vehicle uh, purchased by Deerfield. Uh, so that might be helpful. I know there are some incentives for that. So hopefully it helps to offset it a bit. Yeah, I think nice. that was the fleet replacement credit, right? Yeah. yeah. So that's that one. Uh, the station alerting system, really, once again, the value of this is that we know where we're going and we know we're supposed to go there. So, you know, we're essentially working with a our equipment is very nice, but the system which supports that equipment is fairly antique. And it makes a lot of sense for our regional dispatch out of Shelburne Falls to do what they do. I get it, because there's lots of services. It's not just us. It's police, it's fire, it's ambulance across the whole county. So it makes sense for them to kind of go with this paging network that kind of works okay, um, because it's achievable. Uh, but for us, uh, it is not optimal. Uh, it, it leads to some issues, and I, I do worry as we transition to the digital paging system that we may just miss calls uh, without putting a, a more expensive equipment onto our building. So I'd rather just do it this way. That way, when we get a call, <clears throat> Maybe it's the middle of the night, we get woken up, um, there's graphic information about what the call is, so it decreases radio traffic, which is really amazing. Uh, in emergency communications, uh, sometimes less is more. Uh, and then we have that same view in our ambulance, uh, mapping, and it's just, it's 2024. So, I mean, this is, you know, Nothing new. This is something that a lot of services have been using for decades. Right? So time to catch up. And it's compatible, obviously, with the... Certainly. So that's that one. And, well, gosh, I think that's it. That's it, yeah. So could I ask a couple of questions about the car, or, the, or whatever you're calling it? The intercept uh, vehicle. The intercept vehicle. Um, it can be any kind of electric vehicle. Have you settled on one? <clears throat> um, and if so, what is it? I'm working with two different vendors right now to try and get the best price. Um, the two vehicles I'm most interested in right now, uh, there's the Chevy Blazer EV PPV. It's a mouthful. Basically, it's a pursuit-rated police car that's uh, an electric vehicle. It's a small Chevy SUV. It's all-wheel drive by being pursuit rated. <clears throat> Essentially, it can go fast, it can break hard. Um, it has a really great ground clearance, uh, lots of uh, skid protection underneath, things like that. And it's already fitted out with a lot of the components that we would have to add uh, as aftermarket if we were to upfit it through a vendor. So uh, it actually works out in our favor. Mm -hmm. um, so that's probably the leading contender. Its purchase price is $60,000 with no modifications. So if we can get that down, that's absolutely what I'll go for. The second vehicle that I'm looking at. <clears throat> is this a used vehicle? Is this a new vehicle? This would be a new vehicle. Okay, and, yeah. and it's already got equipment in it that you're saying that you it's not fully functional yet? Yeah, so it would be wired for emergency um, communications. It would already have a number of warning lights and siren module, some of the cabinetry and back uh, for storing equipment. That, that's already been thought of. Now, it's done with police in mind, right? So there are modifications that need to be done. I just don't need a vinyl back seat um, with doors that don't open. Um, what I do need is secure cabinet space and back to store um, medical equipment uh, and keep it climate controlled. That's, that's what's important to me, right? So <clears throat> uh, 
uh, these things are really achievable. Uh, the other vehicle I'm looking at is um, uh, the Ford Mach-E. Uh, it has a Mustang tag on it, but it's an SUV. It's not a little sports car. And uh, these are substantially less money um, than the Chevy. But ultimately, it's going to be about the same because uh, none of that stuff is included in it. So I would bring that to a vehicle upfitter. Um, there's a few of them around um, that do the police vehicles. And you're generally looking at around $60,000 for a vehicle like that. And um, these are new vehicles. Do they qualify for any federal tech in incentives? So is that included in the price or is that something that you would deduct later? We would deduct it later. So instead of being 60,000, it would be five, uh, 52, five or something? Or? Cross your fingers and hope. Yeah. Uh, but I can tell you right off the bat, the purchase price of that vehicle is $60,000 and it, that's without it saying South County EMS on the side. Mm -hmm. That's without anything. Yep. That's without a radio. Um, put okay. into it. Yeah, right. good. And the other question I had is about charging stations. So I own a Model Y. I have a 60 amp circuit in my 100 amp panel that charges at 44 miles an hour. So that's not, not tremendously fast, but we're about to put in three EV chargers. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if in the short range, you put in a 60 amp circuit and you charge it at 44 miles an hour and if you really need to charge the thing you bring it down here plug it into the town equipment that <clears throat> that 15k covers an l3 charger no i understand that yeah. so uh, i'm just thinking if we have a if we need to delay something for a year yeah this is fifteen thousand dollars that we could delay you get an electrician in for 500 bucks he puts this in you plug yeah. it in and um, you save yourself fourteen five. In this case, like since it would come from, um, you know, the, the yeah the rent, the money's already there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. So the money is there. And the other thing, um, and it, it's a very valid question, but you know, the concern there is, are you willing to not be able to use an emergency vehicle because it's charging? You know, right. the the distance on these things, uh, the, their capability, the technology of them. We've arrived. We can absolutely use this in our industry now. Oh, yeah. um, and that's fantastic. Uh, but we need the infrastructure to support it, recognizing that it is an emergency vehicle that has to mm. be ready to go 24 7. So. Yep. No, this was just a short term yeah. question. Sure. But, uh, you know, retained earnings used are also retained earnings unavailable to offset the budget. So. Um. Well, from the rental account, money is there. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions on the budget in front of us? No. Okay. I've gone to turn my page. Uh, I wrote down the mark, but that might be wrong. Not I. It wasn't you? No. It was John. Okay. Um, so we, it has been moved and seconded for the SCEMS Enterprise Fund at $462,966 for the Deerfield portion. Any further discussion or questions? Nope. All those in favor? All right. That passes unanimously, 700. Thank you, right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. So, do you want us to act on it or no? If you want to, go uh, ahead. Uh, yeah, we'll just table it. Yeah. Okay. I think it's going to be adjustable. All right, Candace, you're up. No. <laughs> you sent us new stuff. Do we have new handouts, or are they? She um... sent it. Yeah, there was the the PDS. Yeah. Oh, dang. Okay, you ready? I think so. So we're going to go to the Tilton Library, and that is 610-5400. And um, in your books would have been her um, note 
that went with the budget. I, I didn't reprint it. It looked like it was the same budget that we had voted or that you had given me previously. So, um, so the total of that budget is 215391 They're just going to move in second. So do we have a motion? I'd like to make a motion that we recommend um, 215391 for Tilton Library account number 610-5400. Second. Okay. okay, we're ready. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So um, Candace went to a lot of trouble to um, get this budget within uh, a reasonable percentage increase by uh, finding more money in um, the other funds that she has access to. So um, with that, I think I'll leave it to you and you could talk about a few things that might be changing or things that have changed okay. and then they can ask questions. Okay. okay. Do you want me to go through the whole budget or just the things that may have changed? Just the, anything that's interesting. <laughs> interesting, okay. <laughs> Well, our, it changes. Or whatever, yes, <laughs> they're pretty minor. Okay. Um, the head of young adult services that we had, uh, we've had for a little while now, she took another job that offered more hours. And since we're moving to a temporary space where we'll have less space for um, the duration of construction, I'm not going to hire. I'm not going to fill that position until um, probably next January. So the second half of FY25. So that would be half that amount. So the amount is 16133 So, you know, around $8,000 um, just for next year. And it's actually the timing is good because as we're going to be moving to a bigger space, we're going to need to um, prepare for some more um, technology, maybe some more supplies. It'll just be one time purchases that we'll need. Um, and I think that will be a good place to put that. Um, and then when the person comes on next year, um, then they will fill that that um, whole year role. Um, so I'm sorry, say that again. So you have 16133 down here, but you're saying you're only going to spend 8000 on it and you'll spend the other 8000 on stuff. Yeah, just because this okay. happened before okay. she left. Got it. <laughs> and I want to okay. keep the position open. All right. Um, and as far as anything else, well, the main thing is that the building maintenance, um, there's a lot that um, I'll find out after we're there for a couple months as far as what the cost will be. So it's hard to make predictions. Um, what's going to happen is the building, um, some of the <coughs> utilities like the heat, electricity, I don't think the water and sewer uh, will be left on and the contractor will pay that bill. And then I, I, I talked with Kevin Scarborough and we agreed that we would just keep the instead of switching the accounts at the temporary space at the church or the former church, that I would just pay those bills. Um, the library would pay those bills, um, the electric and okay. heat, water, all the utilities. So I don't know what those will be yet. Um, there just has been some um, mini splits put in and insulation, so I'm thinking that'll help keep the price down. And we'll, we've been told to put the fans on, <laughs> the ceiling fans, um, so that we don't lose heat or, or yeah, don't lose heat. So, um, so I just did kind of basic, I mean, level funding, except for um, an elevator, which we won't have in that building. Um, and there will be a gutter put on, so I'm not sure what that will cost to maintain. It's only a, a annual fee. Um, and then we did get a little bit more money this year from the Dickinson Library Fund, or trust, uh, about double that we usually get. So that, will, that helped. Um, Bring, keep the percentage of the increase down. And I think that's, I think that's all I have. That's different. So and all your people are on the class comp plan, so that increase is dictated by the yes. class comp. Yeah, all but, a student. St but the student employee, yes. Hi. So um, I have a question about the books video, but um, I'm just wondering if you could elaborate on why that has gone up when we're going to be, you know, presumably downsizing the amount of books we're going to have. 
That, that is a criteria for, um, for the state, for the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners that we... Yeah, I know under the MBLC grant we have to have a certain number of, of books and stuff just to get the grant, but um, is, right. is, is this the, the, the grant obligation or are we above the grant obligation for it? We have to be at 20% of the total budget, which is what that number is. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So. And then there's also a mandated increase, right, year on year. Yeah, two point five percent is the, is the. Um, oh, as far for the collection or for the no, entire for budget? the total. The total, yeah, two point five. Of uh, but of the last three years, right? So it, this is higher than it needs to be. It's the average of the last three years, and then uh, two yes. and a half percent above that. So yes, yeah. but not a lot. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> a bit. I'll just go ahead. Uh, point of clarification. Um, and this question, I think, is for Brenda. Where the Tilton Library is budgeted as a single line item and not payroll and expenses, you don't anticipate any issue with that um, young adult librarian position being cost being spent on other expenses. No, not at all. And okay. and the reason the the payroll and everything is in one the one line item is because of the requirement for the book purchases. Yeah. All right, thanks. Any other questions? Go ahead, expect to move into the that is the qu one. that's the question of the year. <laughs> uh, we're getting really close. I've been in conversation with the movers. It's basically the timing around the construction bids, which are due in two days. Um, the 20th of general construction, we already got the subcontractor bids, and um, when the building committee goes over that, if there's any questions, that could push it out a little bit, but if it looks clean and um, everything is you know, meeting the criteria, then we'll move forward. And so, because it takes about three weeks to get the contract ready um, for the contractor, we'll be moving, our, our um, tentative date is like April 7th, April 8th. I mean the brand new oh the brand new. brand new oh okay so we'll take what I just gave you and add a year okay. <laughs> and probably that's what the schedule according to the architect is he's laid it out as a year schedule but I figure you know with the nature of construction projects maybe add a couple months so I'm anticipating May or June 2025 be exciting yeah it's exciting but Very still exciting. during this fiscal year that we're voting right here. So that'll be yeah. going into it. Any other questions, anybody? Or discussion? As every year, we are um, still figuring out the budget. So we will vote this tonight. And assuming that it passes tonight, every, like every budget line item is open for us to revisit. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not, you know, it's the 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 vote is not set in stone until probably about three to four weeks from now. Like, mm. right okay. Close, but um, okay. it, it's at least a provisional. Any other discussion or questions? No. Nope. All right, so it's been moved and seconded for Tilton Library for $215,391. Any discussion? Nope, all those in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? All right, so that passes six zero one. Great, great. Thank you. Very much. I'll thank make a you. Motion thank you. The select board um, approve this budget <coughs> as well. Uh, second. All those in favor? Carolyn Nessai. Tim Hill, GI. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're ready for you guys. <laughs> So you wanted to share your stuff, or you want me to share? I've got a You've got handouts. hard copies. OK. Yeah. That works. And I don't have to figure out where it is in my email. It's um, it, uh, in your book. It's, um, oh boy, Franklin Tech. It's 320-5410. Is the uh, assessment and then the debt service is 320 20 5800. Thanks. 20 
Hello, Russ. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you nice doing? Nice to see you. <laughs> Apparently, what are those? I, apparently, I sweat too much. <laughs> what are those numbers again? Oh, it was uh, 320-5410 is the assessment, um, and then the 320-5800 is the capital assessment. I don't have those sheets. Am I the only one without them? Uh, I think you would have They were on the table one night. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, every night, every time I do that, something gets missed. So I'll. Was he in here? I'll make you a copy. No, we got to keep Is this the bakery of number of students? Yeah. Why it's a forty percent increase? Yeah, basically. Yeah, more kids. Ten more kids. Right. Do you want to go ahead and do your presentation? Well, no. Let's go. Let's get a motion on the table, and then we'll make a motion that we recommend six hundred sixty thousand and seven dollars to the Franklin Tech Assessment Account Number three twenty dash fifty four ten. I'll second that. All right. That hasn't changed. No. Okay. Good, because so that's ready. all we're recommending. <laughs> 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 um, thank you for um, allowing us to address your committee. Thank you for my coming name, down here. My name is Russ Cobras. I'm the business manager at Franklin County Technical School. Been there 25 years plus now. Um, I have with me Liz Bouchard. Liz is my assistant. Liz is our chief procurement officer. Liz is our budget bulldog. Um, <laughs> Liz ran one of the most successful school lunch programs in the probably in the state when you were doing school lunch for us. So I promoted her up to the I stole her and brought her into the business <laughs> office. So Liz is here with us. Rick Rick Martin's our superintendent. Rick had a previous appointment and we've been splitting up. We have 19 towns. We're probably going to do about a dozen FinComs and then we try to get out to town meetings too. So we, we usually split it up and you guys cut the short straw so no I am here <laughs> our um, our budget was we had a budget hearing in February we had school committee vote their final version of the budget uh, just a week or so ago in March so the numbers that you have are the final voted school committee numbers uh, if you look on my little packet, I'm just going to wing it from the first page of the packet, which is just a general budget summary. I've got other pages in there if we want to get into the weeds. Uh, we don't necessarily have to cover everything. So we are presenting a, or we presented to our school committee a $15,372,000 budget. The top part of my sheet here is the budget funding sources. Bottom part is how we spend the money. So if you look at the top part of the sheet, very first line is the assessments that we um, ask from our 19 member towns. So on average or, or in aggregate, we ask for a 3% increase to our town assessments. Um, capital assessments, there were, um, as you had stated earlier, you've got another motion for a capital assessment. That is a 15-year bonding that we did for school improvements. Uh, we re-roofed or resurfaced our roof. Uh, we didn't do a tear down and rebuild the roof. We did some parking lot um, 
projects and we did some uh, renovations of our fields and field lighting and things like that. So we're halfway through that bonding. A little later on, we'll, we'll discuss a MSBA, a Mass um, School Building Authority project that we're in the pipeline for. Uh, I won't hit that quite yet. So top half of the page, you can see where our sources of funding are coming from to balance our budget. Again, asks on average 3%. Mileage may vary by town because it depends on how many students are enrolled from your town at Franklin County Tech. Uh, and we'll look at your 40% increase uh, on a page a little bit later on. We, uh, we got a little bit of a surprise for us for State Aid Chapter 70. So we're a growing school. We've, we've grown in the last handful of years from 532 students, 9 through 12, to about 571, 570 something-ish this year. We're probably going to grow by another 30 or so next year. Uh, we got a smaller senior class going out and we have 230 applications in for pro probably 180 slots um, for freshmen. So we've, we're, we're in the growth mode. Being in the growth mode, we expect Chapter 70 to increase for us. We're out of Hold Harmless. We're a growing school. We expect Chapter 78 to increase, increase for us each year that our population, our student population is increasing. This year, even though uh, the governor promoted herself as a education-friendly governor, Whatever happened in the formula, we didn't get anything. We had 11 student increase. So if you look at the chapter 70, line three across, as it goes across the page, you'll see $500,000 jumps, right? 300, $700,000 jumps. We fully expected, the superintendent and I thought we'd have about a $350,000, $400,000 jump based on 11 new students. Didn't get anything. We got the basic hold harmless, Here's your $30 per student that they hand out to every school in the, in the county. So we were a little bit shocked by that. We came up, we, we absorbed the 3% increase to our member towns, helped absorb some of that shock, and then the rest of it, we absorbed it into our budget. And if you look down on the bottom half of the page under instructional services, line two and uses of, of funding, you'll notice we had about a 3% drop in instructional services. The reason for that, that's a position and not a person. The reason for that is as we grow in enrollment growth, we try to start to build in, project in the future what we need for special ed teachers, paras, et cetera. Just like when a school shrinks, it's not a straight line decline as far as personnel. It kind of goes in steps, same thing on growth. So we had a special ed instructor position built into the budget and we had some pairs built into the budget based on knowing that we're going to get uh, a bunch more kids next year and you know banking on maybe some of them are going to need additional special ed services so we had it built into the budget we took that out to balance our budget we might have to do some scrambling when we find out this summer by the time all the applications are done everyone's accepted we filled every last gap for students coming in we'll know this summer what we need for instructors and we're going to have to live with what we've got here on on paper to do that so that's how we balanced our our, our perceived shortfall in chapter 70. we uh we also use tuition from non-member towns and now i know i've got some questions from the chair of your committee and i can address those um, a little bit later too but we we also as a funding source have tuition from non-member towns Kind of sort of like school choice um, funds that are there for Frontier, for your other high school. We, uh, we're not a school choice school, we're a vocational technical high school, but non-member towns, so we have 19 member towns, any of those other towns that come in, pay full freight for tuition for a student. So they're probably paying $24,000 for a student to come to Franklin County Tech. So we use that as a revenue source to help balance our budget also we use last line line eight on sources of funding is e and d so that's our version of your free cash so we only get a one bite at the e and d pie as school districts per mass general law and that's at budget time so if we come up with a shortfall during the year we can't go have a special school committee meeting and vote for me and d so we get one shot at it 
That being said, we pretty much use what we have for certified E&D to balance or put towards the upcoming year's budget. So that $580,000 we put towards 2025, I had about $581,000 certified by the state. So we used all that up. We have, again, we'll I'll go back to the tuition in students. We have a non-resident tuition fund that acts as our stabilization rainy day fund, whatever you want to call it. We've got about a million dollars in there, gives us enough coverage that if we have emergencies or shortfalls during the year, we can use some money out of that fund. So that gives us our budget flexibility. So how did Deerfield fare? And again, I had said you had gone up 40%. If you flip to page two, page two is our calculation of how we come up with the dollar amounts for our member towns. So you'll see our towns listed on the far left column. You'll see the October 1 enrollment this past October 1. You'll also hear that called the foundation enrollment for schools. Um, prior to education reform in the 1990s, you would basically take Deerfield's 35 students, divide it into 571, come up with that percentage of 6.129%, and you would pay that portion of the assessments. When education reform came in, that went out the window. State came up with this thing called minimum contribution. So they have a foundation, this fictional foundation formula for every school in the district, uh, in the state. They decide uh, how much money it takes to run your school. They decide what the state's gonna pay towards that share and what the towns, at a minimum, need to contribute towards their member schools. So that minimum contribution column gets dictated to me from the state. So everything to the right of that minimum contribution formula <coughs> is based on your proportional share of the 571 students. So can what we can control, question. it's all proportional. So that, that minimum contribution, that's the same equation they use for, for our high school, that like Frontier yep. or Deerfield or whatever. Yep, okay. same, same formula, different, different foundation yep. budget, different calculation because of a, a regular high school versus vocational school. Vocational schools, the state views them as being one and a half times more expensive than a uh, traditional academic high school. So it's a different equation. It's actually more money for the vote. We, they, they, yes, it's, it's supposed to be more money for a vote. Okay. I'll, I can share numbers with you later that everything's getting skewed and it's not so much anymore. That's representative of the vocational education, the machinery, the equipment correct. that would be needed and things like that. Correct, correct. Okay. correct. So on this, on the formula again, state dictates the minimum contribution. So this past year when the state calculated Franklin County Tax Foundation formula, even though we had 11 more students, even though there's a Student Opportunity Act that's supposed to give us extra funds, when they calculated that foundation formula, they came up with an increase. The entire amount of that increase in the foundation formula, the state shared no part of the increase. So that's why we got zero dollars and all of it got pushed into minimum contributions from our member towns. Called Rob O'Donnell at DESE as soon as the numbers came out, to my shock and my delight, he actually picked up the phone on the day the numbers came out because I figured there's probably a hundred other schools calling him. Tr had him walk through the process and said, Rob, what, what can I tell my towns? What is the trigger here and why we didn't get 11, I mean, we didn't get additional aid. I found a vocational school over by Worcester who had 11 more students, just like we did. They got $250,000, $300,000 more in, in aid. We didn't get anything. So I had, I had him on the phone trying to walk Rick Martin, the superintendent, and I through this. He couldn't come up with an answer. He kept saying, well, if you look at this number, well, no, it's not that. If you look at this number, no, it's not that. I, wealth, I don't know what's driving. You know, I, he couldn't give me an answer to say, oh, there's some rich folk who moved into town X, and that's what, that's what drove you know, numbers the way they did. Still don't have an answer to this day. So. Deerfield's portion, as you had put in your motion, 660,007, that's our operating assessment. Page three is a four-year trend. And this page is actually informational for you because you can see for Deerfield, that's highlighted on page three, if you go to the far right, two, hand, two, uh, two columns, your assessment changed by 40%. 
pretty much coincides with what your enrollment went up 40 percent so that's that's the driver in your in your enrollment um, quick switch to page four that's the capital assessment so this is this formula is based on <coughs> half of this formula is based on the u.s census population for your town as compared to the other members of our district and then the other half of the formula is eqv your share of eqv as compared to the total eqv for all 19 towns of our district so it, that calculation being the way it is we came up with 18,000 182.84 for Deerfield for a capital assessment. Then the and remaining pages dead, are all foundation dead excluded, formula. right? That is not dead excluded. Okay. No, that's that's based on how our member towns do it, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's not. That I get asked from some towns. That's not something that we dictate to towns. It's something. Can I just ask that. a question? Sure. I, I don't think it matters. I'm just curious. Why do you spend money on, money on school choice tuition? Like, do so. One of the questions I got from the chair um, is, we there's one school near us, Montachusett Tech, Monty Tech, we call it. Um, for whatever reason decide to be a school choice school so you know school choice is an option that you opt in opt out as superintendents or school committees every year monty tech opts in every year so they get if one somebody from our 19 towns decides to go over to monty tech for a program even if we offer it they can ride over there and do the program monty tech's only going to get about five or six thousand dollars for that kid to me that's crazy we get twenty four thousand twenty five thousand dollars per tuition in kid to our school and if Monty did out its calculations, the full freight of tuition for them would be in the mid-20s also. I have no idea why they chose to be a school choice school, because that $5,000 or $6,000 seat for a seat in the vocational schools, to me, is not financially worth it. So that's why, so that'll come off of our, cha uh, our chapter 78. If somebody, and I usually get a one or two students from Orange, because they're close, right? They'll go, a student may go to Monty Tech. So because it's a school choice tech school, you have to pay the school choice. Yeah. But if they didn't opt into that, then Orange would have to pay the full amount to them. So Orange, dirty little secret, Orange gets billed for the full freight to Franklin County Tech. I bill them for what they owe Franklin County Tech because they're on my foundation formula. Our whole foundation formula is based on an October 1 count. That student going to Monty is on my October 1 count for Orange. So Orange pays the bill to me. I pay $5,000 off it to there. So I can actually make two or $3,000 on that student that doesn't show up. That's why I think it's just completely crazy that Monty, okay. Monty Tech does the choice, but they, they decide to do it. That's pretty much my presentation, unless you all want to dig into Chapter 70 formulas, foundation <laughs> budgets, and can you talk about uh, <laughs> can you talk about future plans? Are you, you guys are talking about building new building or something? Yes. So so thank you. On the bottom half of the of the sources page, when we were going over the, my budget summary on page one, <coughs> you'll notice there's a line down on the bottom half of the page that said um, rental lease of equipment. And that line is now zeroed out. You'll see a few years ago it was 500,000, 517,000. Now it's zeroed out. That money was for, we did a performance, energy performance contract with Siemens Building Technologies, oh, a bunch of years ago now. Um, so we, we look, redid our rooftop units, became more energy efficient as best we could through that program. That 15 year lease ended in 2023. In 2024, and in this upcoming budget, we decided to move the $500,000 down one line into the transfer to capital stabilization fund because we, we have some big ticket items that we either got to address through renovations, systems upgrades, or we got to start looking at building a new school or doing a major renovation with MSBA being a partner. So again, Mass School Building Authority 
for Franklin County Tech will pay somewhere in the 60 to 70 cents on a dollar range for a project if we qualify for it. If we don't get that, we're, pay we're paying or our member towns are paying 100% of whatever we have to do. Like the new roof, the roof that we did seven, eight, nine years ago, that roof coating is only good for about 15 years. So we know, and we can't do a recoating. Next time is going to be a major teardown of the entire roof, put on a new membrane, very expensive. Our electrical systems or infrastructure is failing and outdated. We've done some upgrades to our main switch gear to get us by. So we're hitting the stage like we do as consumers when we have a car and you start pouring money into the car, you gotta decide is it time to trade the sucker in and get a new car or can we continue to get by with maintenance. So we move the money from, from that line. I wanna be very transparent on this because in order for us to do this move, we can only have 5% of our member town's assessments in a capital stabilization fund or moved into a capital stabilization fund in any given year. We've exceeded that. So I had to, I had to petition the commissioner at DESE for permission to put in more money than we are legally allowed to have. So he's got to give me permission to do that. And the reason for that is we want to do a feasibility study. We got into the MSBA program, so we, we're, we want to qualify for the 70 cents on the dollar, 65 cents on the dollar, whatever they'll give us to help us with the project. Their requirement is, before they even put a penny towards us, is do a feasibility study, hire an owner's project manager, hire the architects and engineers, come in and do a study, look at your options, and then we'll start to talk about whether they'll dance with us. And then again, it's gonna take votes from our 19 towns to, to say whether we can do this project or not. So a feasibility study, when we did one 20 some odd years ago, when I was at Franklin County Tech, I think we did one for $250,000, $300,000. They are now, Liz and I looked up research, all the feasibility studies that MSBA required of vocational schools, one near our size, and it was around $1.5 million for a feasibility study. So that'll give us, you know, a thicker, probably thicker than your binders, a thick study that's done. You get an educational consultant comes in, the architects, engineers, they'll give us the rough schematic drawings to get estimates for construction, and they'll, they'll look at every system in our building, how, what condition is our electrical system, and what condition is our plumbing systems, go through the whole school, and then give us a guidebook on here's what you need to either continue to maintain your building and keep it running, or look for either a major renovation project, which they, they'll participate in, for vocational schools, they like to do teardowns and rebuilds. For whatever reason, I think it's because of the equipment and the space needed in shops from, from 1976 when we were built. OSHA and all those standards are different now. A lot of our shops are undersized and kind of grandfathered in. Um, so that's the major piece that's coming down the line for us. And that'll probably take the feasibility study. Liz and I are putting together a request for services. That'll go out sometime in the next couple months. We'll find an owner's project manager. They then help us find the architect, the engineers, architects, to help us with the schematic drawings and the, the rest of the project. So that's gonna take probably a year and a half, maybe two years from now. So probably three budget cycles from now, you'll start to either hear from Franklin Tech, whether we think we need to go forward with the project and we'll come and sell you on it, or We'll look at, we gotta do major renovations and we'll sell you on that too, or whatever we need to do to keep the school viable for another 50 years as we're a 50, approaching a 50 year old school. Any other questions now that I hit you with a 40% increase in <laughs> <laughs> potentially a huge amount for a capital outlay? I've got an easy one, can you spell your name? What's that? I've got an easy question, can you spell your name? K, Spencer. last name, K-A-U, B as in basketball, R-I-S as in Sam. I think it has. First name is Russ, R-U-S-S. S, Sam. Two S's or one? One. So I'm not suggesting in any way that we would do this, but can you talk about like 
what if a town doesn't vote for the budget? So when we last went out, so we did a, actually the, the, the project that the bond, the current bonding is that you're dealing with from mm -hmm. us, that small bonding, is the mechanism for us to go out for towns is we hold a countywide election. So there's an election day for our 19 towns and it's straight majority vote from that. So okay. believe it or not, Greenfield or one of our biggest, bigger towns could could vote no, but if the rest of the population in the county is all voting yes, as long as we get a 51% vote from our, you know, all those members who are voting on that day, we get a yes for our project. Okay. Can you um, can you tell me what the um, I assume you're using um, your capital stabilization balance to do the feasibility study, correct? Yeah. So we threw in a 750 last year. We're hoping to put in this 750 this year. That'll give us the million five that we and are you, estimating. And you've been putting money away all along in capital stabilization. Yes. Have you pretty much been saving that for the future? No. So okay. we, we had a we had almost a catastrophic failure again with our electrical switch gear. So we you know you get these main switch rooms in a in a high school. The switch gear is, oh boy, if there's an electrician in the crowd, help me. It's something Pacific. Federal Pacific. Federal Pacific doesn't make breakers anymore. They don't break, make them that size. So when we were looking at our, my head of maintenance was trying to reset the building one day, wouldn't throw the switch, wouldn't reset, it would break again, throw the switch. Finally got it to reset. So we decided, well, we need, we need to renovate this switch gear or buy another piece can't find them new on the market can find rebuilds so we spent a few hundred thousand dollars on the electrical switch gear in our building to have now we have a backup main breaker so if this breaker fails at least we can call the company schools might be down a day or two and they can switch out the breakers but before if that thing had gone we would have been down we would have been shut down for months because you can't find, somebody would have to rebuild, help us rebuild the breaker. Um, so th that's where the capital, as we've salted away the money, that's getting siphoned off just to keep us functioning and going. If you come to our school, it looks fantastic. Very well maintained, we got, a, we got 500 laborers in the building <laughs> that know the <laughs> trades, so they do a great job of keeping the school up. But if you look, you know, peel the onion back a few layers, it's old. Why is Deerfield's um, per pupil cost the highest so in the 19 towns? Yeah, so you'll see a handful if you go to page two of the handout and you look at the far right hand column assessments per pupil. So again, this is the Education Reform Act that says, hey, if you're a richer town, you contribute more for each student and get less state aid poor town, for, for instance, our poor town is, is orange. A poorer town will get more state aid and their residents don't have to kick in as much. So if you see any of those that are in the $18,000 range, Deerfield is now considered just as rich as some of those towns over by Boston. You've maxed out. So the maximum that you can get for state aid is 17 and a half percent of our foundation budget. So once you hit 82.5, there's a minimum contribution. Deerfield's gonna give Franklin Tech 82.5 of its foundation budget of this calculation. State will give 17.5. That's the same as Newton's, all the other really rich towns. And if you look through this column, you're gonna see we, we got four or five, yeah, was, six towns out here in Western Mass that are considered rich towns. Um, I don't think uh, Deerfield or the nonprofit's property has been pulled out of this calculation. That's what I was wondering. Looking yeah, at I don't think so. What, yeah. what was that? Um, like the head of school, nine, 900,000 salary, right? So wh what we've done. It's a bigger yeah, I, I have no idea what the state puts into it. What, what, what we've done for the last couple of years is um, this is Julie and I are taking a new webinar. I mean, a webinar to update it. But um, we ask that the not, our, our 01342 zip code is the same as Newton and Wellesley and all that. So what we've done is I've asked um, the Department of Revenue to pull out 
the income associated with all the nonprofits, and um, and then that changes our calculation. And I don't think it's happened for this school. So we're getting whacked for those, and then um, are we also getting affected by the people in Whaley that have the South Deerfield? Yes, I've asked for the. Uh, you know, we. Because um, that, that actually is pretty significant. Yeah. Yes, because the uh, Ninja Turtle people are in our zip code. So yeah. what 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 we've done is, um, you know, lying by, I mean, every property. We've taken it off the zip code. We've taken it off the um, property list. I mean, we, and we asked for a waiver. And I don't think that they do it for Franklin Tech. Or they haven't done it for Franklin Tech because it skews it. But they but have it's, for Frontier Regional and for... Well, in the last two years, we don't, you know, we have to ask for it every year. Uh, this is something that I, I discovered. And so I asked for this, I worked with DOR to make this happen. And we have, for two years, they adjusted our aid based on that. But you have to ask for a waiver every year and it has to get individually improved. But I don't think, if you look at this calculation, I don't think that we ever that it was ever applied to Franklin Tech, truthfully. Are, are we, like, st do we still have time to address that? Uh, we, we ask for it every year, or okay. I have asked for it every year. Well, I'm just wondering, did we miss the boat for, 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 for this uh, fiscal well, year? Well, no, because the budget's not set. Okay. It, but but it's, it is granted to us every year. So, okay. I mean, for two years in a row, this will be the third, this is a third request. It's several hundred thousand dollars on our calculations for the elementary school and the frontier. But I, I, I don't think, if you're looking at this, it's not done here, I would say. But, so how would the money get made up to yeah, exactly. Franklin Tech if ours was reduced? Do you know, I don't know. Kick in more, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm just checking. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I have to. I have to call. We would have to call and make a separate request, I guess. But we have increasing students going there. It seems. Like. Yeah. Well, no. What it does is it just recalculates the aid, right? Because it's pulled out the income, so we don't look as. I mean, our Rich. our. Eval our valuation isn't as high. Yeah, but uh, I guess like if if um, that changes the minimum contribution, does that mean that all these other towns are going to have to make up the short? Yeah. Okay. Which is as it should be. It's, it's well, like right. We we yeah. don't collect any taxes. No, no. So I, that my argument yeah. was we collect no taxes, so you can't charge us. It just seems like for yeah. their income. Yeah, zero something. Right. Uh, yeah. But this is something that is a request, our request every year. I mean, I can't guarantee it, but I mean, it's worth an effort, obviously. Yeah. Uh, so. David just pointed out something interesting that Sunderland, Conway, and even Waitley actually are all high up there. They don't yeah. have the nonprofits, so I'm not sure what's going on there. Well, it, it's based on the income, Margaret. So if, if people live there that have income, we're just saying we do not collect taxes from the nonprofits in Old Deerfield. So you can't, you should not be able to collect, count their income towards our evaluation. And in fact, DOR did agree and, and helped us, you know, um, petition DESE. But it, DESE, if, if what happens one year, this was the first year that I found out this under the new formula. DESE would say, well, we don't have the authority. And then I, you got to ask DOR. And DOR says, no, we can't go to DESE. So what we did when we went to um, the MMA conference is we went to person at DOR and said, look, this is what's happening. And she said, oh my gosh, yeah, that doesn't seem to be very fair. So she hand walked it over to DESE and sat there and said, this doesn't seem to be fair. And then they granted it for us two years in a row. And hopefully, we'll get it this year too. I don't know, but I don't think they asked for Franklin Tech. Mm. I didn't. I didn't actually. I mean, it's never been really an issue. So I didn't. Uh, I mean, obviously, with more students, it is now become an issue. But at the time, you know, when we I was doing this three or four years ago, it it really we were just paying our assessment without really paying attention. I would suspect, though, for Deerfield, that the, the wealth and not that calculation is used for all schools. 
I think if you fixed it, it fixed it for all three of your schools <coughs> in the foundation formula when they start to calculate it in the foundation formula. Certainly be worth confirming. Yeah. 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 I would. Yeah. yeah. And you're right, we have talent. Irving has, um, you know, the power company, would, yep. they've got a ton of property that's not on the tax roll. So it, if you can get in the game, I suggest you guys get there first and you probably get, maybe it helps and give you a break. But I yeah. think eventually if all towns are doing it, it's probably becomes a zero sum game. Well, we also have that issue of the mailing address or the zip, the mailing zip code for yeah, certain people in I Waitley. I lived in Waitley for a while and I had a, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had a deer So I, I know there's Long Plain Road, River Road, there's a, there's a few yeah. where there, yeah. So, yeah. It just, it's just a lot of work every year and it's not guaranteed. So, I mean, I don't want to promise anything. I don't, I don't. Any other questions? Anybody? Nope. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded for Franklin Tech assessment at $660,007. Any discussion or questions? All those in favor? All those opposed? Abstentions. All right, so I make a motion that the select board approve this one. as well. Second. All those in favor? Carolyn Nessai. Tim Hill, GI. All right. And you want to do that on the Let's do debt service. Um, so the next one, do we have a motion for Franklin Tech debt service? Next page. I'll move to recommend the sum of $18,183 as the Franklin Tech, uh, Franklin Tech debt service assessment line item 320-5800 for FY25. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Proposed abstentions. That passes 601. Um, I will make a motion the select board approve this as well. Second. Uh, all those in favor? Carolyn Nessai. Tim Hill, GI. All right. Thank you so much for coming all the way down here. Thank you all. Appreciate very your. Much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the, all the information, too. So, I would actually like to go to 7.30 if you guys are okay with that because we, we have we a do. lot to, okay. Yep. Um, Brenda, what do you want to do? Do you want to do the other school ones or do you want to do um, we, some of your miscellaneous stuff? Uh, we certainly can. Um, how about, I'm trying to remember which one, I, not, um, Having not been here today um, makes it hard. I'm not as prepared as I should be. Um, I did hand out the K-9 control budget that did come to us from Greenfield. How about if we vote that one first? Let's do that. Okay. It's 292-5400. Um, I'm not trying to be picky, but it, it's really animal control officer. Oh, it is. Yes, you're right. And I did change that in the system at some point. Uh, yes. The but not, reason, I did not change it on here. The only reason is because they handle bats and skunks. And yes, yes, yes. No, I, I'm quite he aware of Carol and I just that on, missed it. Uh, which has dropped from the Board of Health uh, responsibility. So I'll move the sum of $22,266 for animal control, account number 292-5400 for FY25. Second. All right. Discussion? Uh, we split this b with Montague and Greenfield. We pay 25%. Uh, Montague um, pays 25%, and Greenfield pays 50%. Greenfield is the host on this. Um, and uh, I know every year we are asked if we you know, get our 25% um, service. And every year that we... Um, that I check, we are well over 25%. So we, we don't say too much about that, but um, we get our services. It's a pretty hefty salary increase. Question? I did notice that too. Yeah. Do you take any questions yet? Yes. Why did health benefits go down? I mean, I'm glad it did, but everywhere else it's up. 
Um, Does that mean that Greenfield's health insurance plan had a decrease? No, but um, I think he changed plans, but I'm not 100% sure, John. I can verify that for you. Maybe um, we should look into what they're doing. Maybe we should do it. No, theirs has gone up double digits. Ours has actually increased less than Greenfield's. But um, I think uh, when you go from a family plan to one uh, to spouse plus one, there is a drop in price. And I think that's what happened, but I can verify it for you. I'm okay with it. I mean, I just okay. I don't, I, think, it's, I don't think it's worth a lot of investigation. It's it, it's based on their expense, but I can tell you Greenfield um, has a double digit increase in because um, the new mayor. I I'm, I've been meeting with the new mayor, and she wanted to know what our increase was, and she was um, envious. Envious. <laughs> yes. I d I don't want to say too much. Maybe they made some sort of plan design change or something. Uh, who knows? <laughs> uh, no, he switched, I think, to oh. spouse plus one, but I'm not 100% sure. This, that's just anecdotal. I could verify it. So it's a big salary increase, though. 11%. It's like 10% increase or something in salary. 11. It could be based on hours, too. I don't know. Be hour increase, I'm not sure. Right. Anybody have discussion? Do we want to go back to, it's Greenfield who hires the person? Yes. Are we okay with this, or do we want to go back to Greenfield and ask for details on any of the increases, or? I'm fine with this. You anybody? You directing that at me because of the health insurance? No, I'm fine. no anybody in the room. I mean, I, I'm like 10 percent salary increase seems heftier than um, many That's that we see. Too, yeah. um, but there's nobody here who knows the answer, so it's not enough to worry about. Maybe we should vote it and then still look for the information. So That's what know. I was thinking. Yeah. Okay. I, I can find out that information. Oh, great. Okay. Thanks. But All right. Vote, and vote we have a motion. Yeah, we have a motion out there. Any further discussion or questions? Anybody? Carolyn, if you could get a copy of the employment contract, if it is a contracted employee, that would probably help greatly. Um, uh, we have an IMA, but I don't, I don't. Uh, for their employment contract, the Greenfield oh. employment contract for the employee. I, I think he's just a paid person. Okay. Yeah, I don't think he's under contract. Okay. But I, I think there's an hour increase, but I, I will verify that. Okay. That would Thanks. make sense then. Yeah. Any other discussion or questions? No. All those in favor? Uh, that's unanimous, 700. Okay. Um, <coughs> oh, go ahead. I make a motion to approve this as well. Second. All those in favor? Carolyn Nessai. Tim Hill, GI. Thank you. I'm sorry, I always forget that. Um, do the schools, and then uh, if we have time, I know we've tabled uh, Board of Health salaries. Okay. Um, at one point in time, uh, we tabled. Let's do schools. That might take us the whole rest of the day. I was just going to say, I, I, would, <laughs> okay. I don't want the, we have to get sort a out that board of expense oh, budget. Okay. <coughs> I already asked, told Julie about that. Okay. That we're going to sort that out before we f f do the final one in case we have to change it again. Okay. But right. we wouldn't be able to do that until you had some time to All look right. at it. Let's start with, I guess, Deerfield Elementary since it's first. 350, 400? Yeah, 300 400. 5400, sorry. Do we have a motion? Did that get handed out in the meeting? I want to oh, it very well could have been. Sorry. I can, I can just share. Brandon, let's keep it. I don't want you to have to go. There's very little information. Oh, there's very little information. Those, um, it's I'm almost recommending. Oh, that's it. Okay, sorry. 400? No doubt. Yeah, it's not Sorry. not a big thing. Yeah. Okay, great. I'll move to recommend the sum of five million four hundred twenty-three thousand fifty-five dollars for Deerfield Elementary School at three hundred dash fifty-four hundred for FY twenty-five. Second. I don't know why. Okay. All right. So this so this does represent a decrease from their initial uh, budget that they proposed. Um, I know Margaret, you went to that meeting. I I can't remember now what the it seems like they took 87,000 out, but I can't remember exactly why. Um, 
I wish Trevor was here because he'd be able to just I think rattle it, it off. Yeah, I think it had to do with the paving. Chair is here. I can't speak to that. If you'd like to go. Oh, yes, please. Yes. Uh, Carrie Etch is on the chair of the Deerfield School Committee. Is this Does that work? enough? Does that work? Yeah, that okay. we can hear. Um, so it was 87,000. When we realized how high the transportation costs were coming in, uh, we did have 87,000 from leftover rural aid funds that was going to be designated to repair the driveway, the loop where the buses pull in right in front of the school. Yeah. Needs to be repaired, but this felt like a more urgent need. So we'll put off driving the a little portion of the driveway there and apply it. And that helped reduce it down from 4.65% increase down to three. Okay. Right. Which is greatly appreciated in this yes. year's budget, which is. If you'll pardon me, how do you spell your name? Carrie, C-A-R-E-Y, E-T-C-H-E-L-L-S. Probably a question for Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, what is the date of your next meeting? And have because I know they have not voted the budget yet because they wanted to have more discussion on the transportation contract. Yeah, let me count. Um, it is next Tuesday, the twenty sixth at seven. Okay, thank you. Oh. Okay. I'm a bit confused, Brenda. You said they reduced it from the previous estimate. The previous estimate I have here says. Five million three hundred ninety-seven. Yeah, this was yeah. Five million that that was a very preliminary budget that that Trevor passed off to us in January, okay. but then they had voted a much higher nice. increase. Yeah. So if the school committee hasn't voted it yet, maybe we should wait till they vote it. Make a motion to table this until the school committee votes on the budget. Second. All right. Any Could, discussion on the motion to table it? Um, I would just like to make a comment about yeah. the budget. So if we're tabling it, I would like to discuss it first, yeah. So I guess I would oppose the motion to table just because I have a few comments. Can I just make my comments anyway? <laughs> it's, I, it's discussion. Uh, <laughs> sure. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, and and I'm just partly because I'm, I'm afraid I'm not going to be a good member and I'm probably not going to be here next uh, couple of meetings and so this may be discussed in the next couple mm -hmm. of meetings um, and <coughs> Carrie I don't know if you can answer this or, or Brenda but I'm just wondering in the current proposed budget what the school choice um, balance line looks like year to year sure and I'll explain why I'm mm -hmm. While she's Curious looking for that, that, I just, I think, I, I, just can a little Can you pull the microphone over? I can, I can tell you what the school choice fund was, the balance of it as of uh, February 29th. It was a million fifty-four thousand. Okay. So, I, um, and Carrie, Carrie, just interrupt, Carrie, if you get a number. Just interrupt if you get a number. Okay. Well, yeah. Okay, so. Obviously, you know, the schools should be funded to the max uh, as far as I'm concerned. But if, in fact, we are going to have a difficult budget year and we're going to need to make some decisions, um, most of the years that I was on the school committee, and I can't remember how many years I was on it, maybe 10 or so, but for almost all of that time, we were led to believe, and I say led not in a, in a bad way, but there was some disconnect between, I think, here and the former business manager at the elementary school. And that school choice balance, which is kind of like a rainy day fund, which just is there and goes year to year, was we were always happy because it was at about $500,000. And somehow, all of a sudden, that balance got up significantly higher. And while I'm all for conservative budgeting principles and having an emergency fund in there for a certain amount of time, um, it just struck me over the last few years when I learned that it was up to a million, that that is money that could, that it's the kids' money or it's the town's money, uh, and, and it's just sitting there. I think it's too much to have as a reserve fund. It's almost 20% of the total elementary school budget. 
So if, if again, depending on how hard our times are, it seems like you can work that down. Sorry, Brenda, you've had your, yeah. So I remember a discussion last year when we were reviewing this budget and talking about school choice yep. that um, Darius or Shelley had said that they would be using maybe two, three hundred thousand dollars of that this fiscal year for some things that they didn't want to ask us for. Yep. So I think their intent was to have it have it built up, but they were going to be using it in this fiscal year. I, I could be wrong. But so the, it, and the only and I totally agree with you that often that's talked about as a reason not to be more aggressive with it. But as you've just said, the balance right now is a million fifty four still. Right. So right, that you've only got a few more months true. to take it down, and then the next fiscal year starts, and and the and the additional two fifty to three hundred thousand gets put into it. Yeah. So again, all I, just it's not. I'm not complaining about anything. That's. I'm right. just saying there was something was awry somewhere in those years because we always were happy that there was five hundred thousand in it. Right. And, and I and, and I jumped. I wasn't too concerned about that at this point because I thought his comment was that they would be doing that in the latter latter quarter of this year. But Let, that's my recollection. Maybe the rest of you remember you mean, remember the comments differently. There was discussion at the school committee meeting that they are using some of the school choice funds. I can't. I don't know how much. Okay. And, and absolutely, you do every year. You do, and. The question is how much should be deficit spent if in fact the town is needing to look for some monies. Got it. Yeah. And, and not it's at all good, to cut anything at the school. Point. It's to use funds that are sitting there to be used for the school, for the school. Right. Because it's not earning 5%. I mean, it's not. No. Earning. It's just sitting I'm there. I'm sure not. Yeah. So the handout from two months ago um, had 326,000 of school choice going to offset the general um, which, fund. Which isn't a but lot. You, but, but, but how much, but then you've got the revenues coming in on that. Right. So it, so how much is how much are we taking off of the million that's there year to year well, rolling they, over? You um, know, the, the state is reducing that number all the time. Um, the, which number, oh, the 5,000 per student? What's that? Wh which number are they reducing? The um, school choice money uh, has has been dropping every year, and I want to say three hundred and twenty-six thousand is about what what the state is giving so us this year. Maybe it's yeah. dropping it's, because we have less school choice kids. Yes. Not the number per student is the same. Uh, right. Yeah. Right. The five thousand has been the same the entire time. Carrie, oh. Carrie's ready to talk. Uh, Please. <laughs> Julie was right. It's three hundred twenty-six thousand this year. I'm sorry, I cannot find uh, the document that shows what what the historical total has been. Um, but it, we have been using it. Um, and we, because the past few years we've reduced class sections in many cases, we have fewer, less, much greater, less capacity for school choice students going forward. So in the past there's been several students per grade, 10 per grade sometimes. It's gonna be one or two students per grade for almost every grade next year and the following years. So we are going to be looking at a decrease in school funds coming in in the future. So the 326,000 or whatever we're putting on it in future years would significantly eat away at that. Uh, so that's something we're considering for the future, how we can move things off the school choice budget into the general fund. Mm -hmm. So we do appreciate your concerns, but we're, we're doing what we can. <laughs> yep. <clears throat> So I just putting that out there because it's it's a it seems like it's but a it's very a possible possible source if we're desperately looking for yeah the difficult hundred thousand dollars for the right the difficult budget or something yeah sort of political piece of it it's not anything one can grab it's basically a message to say you need to spend school needs to spend their budget differently they need to take money from there and ask for less from right. us right yeah right yeah yeah. Okay. Any further discussion on this before we don't vote? <laughs> I have other questions related to the transportation contract, but I don't have. There's nobody here to answer them, so I'll. <clears throat> okay. I have no no more questions for today. <laughs> okay. So we have a motion on the table to table this um, <laughs> item. Any discussions on that motion? 
No, all those in favor of tabling this item uh, against abstentions. Okay. So that passes 601. So we've decided not to vote on this this week. Um, I move to table this as well for the select board. And we'll second that. All those in favor? Carolyn Ness, aye. Tim Milchi, aye. Okay. Um, we still have 12 minutes, so let's see if we can do Frontier Regional. Frontier Regional, 310 yep. 5400, and then we've got their capital and their transportation, the two budgets right after that. So, okay. So we have a motion for Frontier Regional. I move to recommend the sum of 4377770 for Frontier Regional School account number 310. We have a second. Second. All right. Um, <laughs> so any discussion on that one? Anybody? Do you have anything you want to No, this is this is the same uh, number that they they gave us initially in February. That hasn't changed. Um, what they did do was they removed their request for a capital item in the amount of 48,123 from their um, <coughs> from their request from the t for the town uh, so that's that's uh, and i can't remember i, I know it, it was um, i know it was a discussion it was a question you had yeah brought yeah. up yeah um I can explain that if anybody cares. So what they had done, they had funds in hand. They used the funds they had in hand to pay off the um, essentially the entirety of the item that we had voted several years ago to debt exclude, which was a whole bunch of various things things I don't I don't know it was like auditorium repairs and roof repair. I don't remember there's a whole like a whole category of stuff mm -hmm. um, then they had a new request for a hundred thousand dollars on a fire alarm system so that item would not be debt excluded so what I asked them to do was to pay off all except for a hundred thousand dollars of the already debt excluded item and then pay off pay for the fire alarm using the funds they had in hand so we are paying the same amount and our percentage it comes out to like 48,000 or something so we're paying the same amount we would have except it comes pre-debt excluded because we already voted does that make sense mm -hmm. yeah. everybody's with me on that okay um, Good work but but that's not in the body of this do you, no, and it won't even be in fiscal 25 that'll be something we'll pay in fiscal 26 I'm guessing because I didn't see anything in their newly revised budget that left it in there, took it out completely. Yeah. See, I'm a little confused because I, I went to the budget meeting that they voted and I was told it was going to come in at point eight. And so the increase, the increase from 1.65 was point eight. Um, I, I only have it in my text, and be, I don't know which text be, it's in. Because, because you were maybe looking at the total, well, no, that wouldn't have. No, it, that, would, it was something that happened after the 14th of February. Have, it happened in March. So it was the last Thursday, or maybe it was the, it was last week, I, I believe. This was the most recent information that I had from that week that they voted, so. If there's something else, yeah, I'm I think I'm I think this is it. outdated, but I could be wrong. I move to table this until we have further information. <laughs> Second. <laughs> okay, well we got real far there, didn't we? Oh my lord! <laughs> we got white noise here. <laughs> oh, what happened? That worked. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not touching it. All right. um, any discussion on tabling the frontier stuff? No. All those in favor of tabling this item? Opposed? Um, abstention? That passes 601. I'm sorry, I didn't write down. Margaret voted. Who, who seconded it? I seconded it. 
I'm sorry, I moved it and seconded it. Um, so let's, right. let's skip all three of these, I think, until okay. um, gives us a week to figure out. Which uh, way we'll up. table, the select board will table. <coughs> we don't need yeah. to vote. Do we want to do, oh, do you guys, or is that, do you want to do maturing debt? Yes, we, we most certainly can. That's 710-5900. Uh, All right. So we discussed this once before, and we tabled it pending the discussion about the wastewater treatment plant. Um, Correct. Portion of it. Has everybody found it? 710-5900? I thought we already approved that. No, we, we didn't vote it. it. We tabled it. So... We, d we discussed it. We discussed okay, it, but we did not vote it. Yeah. Is this the yeah. 119 revision? Yep. Okay. Do we have a motion? I'll make a motion to uh, recommend uh, $401,679 for maturing debt account number 610-5900. Second. Okay. okay. So um, this has <laughs> the set debt. Uh, payment for the garage of 245000 in it and the two bond um, principal payments at 25% because your wastewater treatment plant pays for 75% of it. So those are in here. The only thing that could have even been a variable would have been the 100000 on the short-term borrowing that we're doing on the rest of the wastewater treatment plant project. And we had decided with the wastewater treatment plant vote that we would pay down 400,000, 300,000 of it was coming from the wastewater treatment plant and 100,000 coming from here. We did discuss at one point in time seeing if we could pay down 600,000, but after looking at the, um, the sewer enterprise fund and what we could do there, we decided that that was not an option. So this is left at our idea of doing a $400,000 band pay down. So this is the correct amount, this is where you yes. would recommend that it yeah. okay. Any questions, discussion? Nope, all those in favor? Uh, unanimous seven zero zero. Great. Um. Um, I make a motion we approve this account as well. Second. All those in favor? Carolyn S. I. Tim L. G. I. Mm -hmm. Unfunded sick leave. Have we done that one? Uh, we this was tabled also. Second. We tabled that with the idea that we were going to go back and look at it. Um, this is uh, nine ten dash fifty eight hundred. Um, Casey and I did discuss it and felt like it could remain as it, as it is and we would split the money with the department f from which the person is retiring um, and, and it would just absorb it. It'll be fine. So we've decided to leave it at the 10000 if you're if you're comfortable with that. Did, you, did, okay. the, did the select board discuss it again or not? No, we didn't discuss yeah. it, but I think we agreed that there was. Yeah, because we're talking, you know, it might be another four or $5,000 more than that, and, and the, the, the uh, highway budget can, can absorb the difference. Yeah. Okay. Any discussion? Oh, no, we don't have a motion. I'll make a motion to recommend $10,000 for unfunded sick leave and vacation account number 910-5800. We have a second. I'll second that. Any discussion? All those in favor? Oh, yeah. oh sorry. Go ahead. You had discussion? So we, we just had, we talked about the highway department budget last week or two yes. weeks ago. Yep. And discussed how, how tight the general highway, well, general highway expense. I know he had made some reductions. Is there really room? I mean, is there room? Is there $9,000, $8,000, $9,000? It's really hard to say. Okay. Um, we don't have an exact retirement date yet. 
Um, we don't know what it's going to take to get a new highway superintendent. Um, we usually don't spend quite as much money on overtime as we plan to. So I think I'm, I'm fairly comfortable with it, with, with not knowing, not having answers to some things. Bef before, before the person retires, the select board was going to work on reorganizing some of the job descriptions and the, and the, and the, and the general organization. So, I, you know, I, is it gonna, what does it cost to go out and go get a new person? It always costs more. So, but is there gonna be a gap potentially? So, okay. I, I mean, I, I feel I like it, it's, it's unknown, but I feel comfortable that we can cover it, Margaret. Okay, I, I apologize for the late question. I just That's fine. No, we wanna okay. make sure we discuss everything. Any other questions? No, all those in favor? That passes 700. I make a motion to approve this budget as well. Second. All those in favor? Carolyn Nassai. Tim Hilchey, aye. Okay. Okay. I think that's enough. We have Great. three minutes left to adjourn. So anything else we need to talk about tonight? Oh, um, yes. I'm not going to be here next month. Oh, no. Uh-oh. <laughs> Anybody willing to volunteer to fill in for Jim next week? Uh -huh. I can't even read my own way. <laughs> Anybody? It's coming that Monday, the 25th. The 25th. Yeah, that's the 25th. And David, you I'll said you're and I can, I can. You're going to be doing something fun, aren't you? Mm -hmm. it, I just hope that it's. I hope that it's taped because I'm not. Yep. Going to be, I'm not going to be really reliable. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you for volunteering to do that. Um, anything else we need to talk about before next week? No. Okay. Do we have a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. A second. second. All those in favor. Against? Abstentions? <laughs> Passes I I, six I, I, zero yeah. zero. <laughs> One no vote. Who didn't vote? John. Oh. I don't know. Maybe I just didn't see Maybe it. Maybe I'm sure that the passed seven zero zero. We have a one, two, three event. My chair is too comfortable. Um, so All right. Stay. We're adjourned. Thank you so much. Okay. John, John, and um, Capitol's moving in, so we need to so, vacate yep. our spots so that they have. Casey, um, did, you, uh, did you have that motion for us to award the contract? Is the item not anticipated for the select board? I do not. Um, you have a good give trip. me. I Thank you. Have a good trip. Where is that? Let me read the email I sent out. It is, it is on Wednesday to read both. The problem is with Thursday, you know, and then it's Easter week. So I wanted to do it tonight and re vote it if there was any question. So was this for us or was this for you? Okay, so I sent an email out this afternoon. Um, Thank you, Rick. You would ask me to develop something for tonight's I meeting. I can't think without it. Um, we received two bids for the roof repairs. One was from Synaxo LLC. Baseline bid was $235,832. You know what, Casey, it's, it's so noisy. Can, can you, you probably can't come out here, can you? Yeah, I still, somebody has to take notes, so, because you're still, your meeting is still going, so. Right. Give me a or, minute. Do you want to do it after Capitol? I'm not going to stay after oh, Capitol. Oh. I'll do it now or I'm going home. Everybody asks me, why don't you just go up to Vermont? But I, my response is, I know what Vermont is like in April. No, <laughs> we're not. Okay, well, I'll stay. Right. Plus, you know, no, 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 there's no, always no, the no, chance no, of rain there. there. So it's like, if it rains here yeah. in Austin, yeah. there's yeah. all kinds We're going to stop to go there, too. The <laughs> <ones that are, laughs> we're pretty much done. Oh. <laughs>
said to one of my friends, we do, you know, Texas stuff. <laughs> So barbecue. when we get barbecue, oh, that's definitely on the plan. Yeah. Barbecue. Um, uh, so she should be here right. She's right there. Tex Mix. My initial thought is yes, I might get more. Yeah, probably. I know some of my friends are more musically inclined than I am, so this is probably going somewhere. At least one for coming. Well, that's not Telly. Are you uh, keeping your meeting open, Carolyn? Yes. Okay. Oh, we're just we're just going to vote this one thing, Mark. Sure. It'll just take two seconds. The only reason why I ask is we have to switch zooms, but we have yeah, that's fine. No. You, oh, we have to switch zooms. That's the problem. Okay. So what do we just need to do? We just need to make a motion to accept. Accept. The, yes. From, okay. Make a motion. <laughs> I, I make a motion that the select board. Uh, accept the uh, the bid from Synaxo LLC for um, two hundred thirty-five thousand eight hundred thirty-two dollars to fix the uh, the relish and for Alt one three th uh, three thirty-seven thousand seven hundred two dollars for a total amount of two hundred seventy-three thousand five hundred thirty-four dollars. I second that. All those in favor? Tim Hilchey, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Thank you. We will further discuss this on Wednesday. Um, Thank you, Casey. You guys have to adjourn. Um, I make a motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Tim LGI. Carolyn Nessai. Okay. <laughs>